Hi everyone, my name is Carrie Brummer, and if this is your first time on the Facebook page or on the YouTube channel for Artist Strong, you are most welcome. I've created Artist Strong as a community of creatives to help support one another, build your skill, and find your voice as a creative. I offer all kinds of free and paid for resources to help you do exactly that. And today is one of those free resources called Feedback Friday. Feedback Friday. Let me double check. I'm going to just put my comments up. Give me a shout and say hi if you can hear and see me and you're joining me live today. Uh, Feedback Friday is a weekly episode throughout the fall and winter where I give artists opportunities to get feedback from someone other than themselves. We can get so caught up and so busy with the making, but we need time to reflect and assess on what we're doing so that we can really be confident in all the choices we're making. And feedback is one of those key ingredients to help you do exactly that. So in Feedback Friday, artists give me links to their websites or social media or artworks in progress or finished works and ask for me to read the work and give them new ideas. Hi Tia, good, excellent, you guys can hear me. So this is your chance to have exactly that. So without further ado, I'm gonna switch over because we've got, I think six artists today that I'm going to be looking at, including Tia. So let me um, hide the banner here and I'm gonna share my screen. It'll look weird for a minute. So don't mind me as I kind of move everything around to get things ready for us. And I can still see you in the comments. So um, feel free to comment and add your own two cents to things. Or if you're watching the replay, um, I still think it's valuable to hear people's feedback. A lot of people watch the replays for this. So um, feel free to add your two cents as well, because the whole idea of feedback is to give people information so that they can make their own choices. It's not about us knowing what's best for another artist. It's an opportunity for us to give them information and a different perspective so that they can make informed decisions for their own art. So the first person we have today is a gentleman named Gregory. He emailed me and said, hey, Carrie, this is a recent piece of mine. I'm hoping to get feedback on it, as well as what type of print paper I would use to make copies of it. I usually use Instagram and Facebook for showing my art, but was wondering if there are better ways of marketing myself. I hope this isn't too late to participate in Feedback Fridays. So he's asked several questions. So let's see how quickly we can get to them. Um, so before I show you his image, why don't I talk first about some of the other bits? So print paper, um, it really depends on what your aim is with the prints that you're making of your art. So if you want to offer high quality, um, high quality prints as uh, a paid for option for clients and you want to print them yourself, it's not just about the quality of your paper, it's also about the quality of your printer. I am not an expert on this because I actually outsource this. I use a company called iPrintFromHome.com and they make me fine art Gicle prints of my paintings. I love them. They're really good at color matching. They have a whole system to help you make sure that you're being accurate in your colors um, when you upload your digital images to their website. And yeah, I just love them. They're a small company based in upstate New York and they ship to US and Canada. So I use them for prints of my artwork. Um, I would say that you want to use some kind of archival paper. Um, you know, you don't necessarily want there to be too, min too much texture to the paper if you're using your own printer. Um, if you want to make sure that there's kind of a solid ink layout of, of the print. But, um, you know, I do think you can Google resources like this or even post this question inside the Facebook group or on the Facebook page. And I'm sure people in the community might have some additional help or support on that question. Now, um, marketing. Um, I usually use Instagram and Facebook for showing my art, but wondering if there's a better way to market myself. There, <laughs> I, I, um, I don't know how to start answering this question, but I want to, I guess I'm going to jump around a little bit. Instagram and Facebook are tools you can use to market, but I would argue, I don't think it matters where, um, what social media platform you're using to market. I think it's about how you're showing up 
and offering value to people who who are witness to your posts on social media and are those posts engaging them exciting them getting them to talk to you and get to know you because it's engagement is about making real connections and developing relationships with people that's how artists sell their art so whatever social media platform you're on ask yourself do i get people responding to my posts am i responding to other people's posts is there a way to build conversations or ask questions when i post my art or art and progress that make people feel participants in the creative process and journey. When people feel like they're part of making the artwork, they feel more ownership of it. They feel greater trust in you and the work. Because a lot of times when we're marketing online, it's unlikely that that person's going to see the artwork in person before they invest in it. And that's a big kind of fear gap to deal with. Is the work really going to look like what it looks like online when I receive it in the mail? So how can we overcome some some of those potential objections or concerns collectors might have when they see our work online. That's one reason a lot of artists will show images of their artwork hanging up in spaces so that people can start to imagine what that artwork would look like in their own home. So think about what are you doing to market yourself? Um, I'm working on a book right now um, by Seth Godin that just came out that's talking about marketing and how it's not this ugly thing that people make it out to be. There are a small group of people who choose to make marketing ugly and use it for dubious reasons. But as creatives, we're using marketing as a way to share our art with the people who want it. That's a wonderful thing to be doing. So when we look at the marketing that way, ask yourself, what choices am I making and how I curate my social media feed? Am I allowing people be, to be participants? How can I share more of the background stories and me as a person to help develop those relationships? So now let's take a minute and look at his artwork. Um, feedback on the artwork. Okay, so uh, first off, I love how vibrant and busy this is. There's something about it. It's very energetic because it's full of so many things going on and all these images are kind of melding and growing in and out of each other. And that creates a lot of visual stimulation. So it feels very active to me. Um, I, I do find it's interesting that then, you know, I say that and then I see the contrast. Let me, I'm going to get my pen going here. Um, and then I see the contrast of this whole space on this side, which feels rather, there's mo there's motion because you have all these lines kind of moving around the tree, but then it's very stark. It only has two colors. It's monochrome, essentially. It's blue and white. And same here with the grass. So it goes from kind of all the colors of the rainbow all melded together and doing stuff to kind of this very stark, different feeling on this bottom third of the painting. Um, it does make me feel like, you know, maybe that's part of the storyline. There's some kind of rift in space or in the world, and we're kind of seeing two different dimensions. I have that kind of read of this. Um, I am curious, though, about harmony and how to harmonize this whole piece. So for me, this green, there is a lot of this green throughout over here. And so all of this feels like it's one unit even though the ground has some separation to me and I do see a divide here, okay? When it comes to the tree, I don't, even though that blue has been used over here, I don't feel the same level of integration with the whole painting. And I think it might be in part because the tree here is kind of the cream or white of the paper. Um, I'm not entirely sure. But let's look at, um, let's look at it in black and white because I think that could be, oops. I think that could be part of why I'm having some kind of curiosity or, or concern around this. Um, so that could be one reason this is dominating for me or really standing out despite all of the energy on the right side is this is the largest area of white space we have in the whole image. We have some lovely white areas in here. Um, and I wonder if there should be some more white kind of these are all the same kinds of gray kind of this down here. We see the values don't shift very much. So that could be a way to keep the tree white and light. But perhaps we need to add some of those lighter values throughout some of the designs kind of in this middle area. You can see, you know, you've got one little area with white, but everything else is kind of variations of gray with some darker black. So that, that might be a way to help have some balance while still allowing that kind of division feeling of, of this kind of rift in space, as I'm calling it. 
Um, I like how busy it is. I don't know why, but there's part of me, um, when I was looking at this, there's part of me that kind of wants to see all these creatures fill this space and then have this top edge almost be kind of like a landscape um, silhouette or horizon line and then have a tree actually standing up here. Um, I don't know why that's something that kind of came to me, but that's, that's a visual I had. I could see a series of works like this where we explore all of these different ideas and keep playing on this theme of this kind of otherworldly, um, you know, creatures and things going on um, right next to kind of a uh, typical portrayal of landscape or nature. Uh, so I hope, Gregory, that gives you some food for thought. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. And if you do make changes to this work or have future works, we'd love to see them. So please email me, carry at Artist Strong, or you can post it on social media and tag me so I can share it with everyone in a future Feedback Friday. Okay, I think that covered most of Gregory's question here. So let's get to question number two. Um, uh, this is from Tia. Um, she's uh, working on something and she'd love it to be part of Feedback Friday. She's really interested in feedback on composition and technique. Um, she really wants to know what she can work on for improvement. Um, and she's willing to work on it more or leave it as it is. So she gave me two images of the work in progress. So let's see if I can find them. Okay, yeah. So here's kind of, here's a shot that we'll use to work with for critiquing. But she also gave us an angled shot. So we can see she's working with, um, oh, I forgot what medium you were telling me. I mean, it's watercolor, but then there was something else that you added to you and I in the email, the second email um, that you said was new for you. Um, but you can kind of see some of the, the layering going on in this image. Uh, so first off, um, I love Tia's use of borders. This is something I noticed. I think it's, oops, sorry. I just did something weird. Let go. Um, I, I would say that this is something that I, I see as a signature part of her work is her decision to um, have edges and borders kind of part of, part of the artwork. Let's invert this. Gouache. Um, yeah, thank you, Tia. Yeah, so she's combining gouache with watercolor. Kirsten, hey, she says they're great. Um, I agree. Um, so I really like this border stuff and, and how it's incorporated into the design. And I do think that's a signature part of the style that I'm seeing in her work now, no matter what medium she uses. And if it's something she enjoys, I encourage her to continue to do it because I do think it's powerful and it's, um, it's bringing... Um, a nice perspective to the work or it, um, that's not the word I want. I, um, it really offers a really nice way to uh, kind of engage with the work and have our eyes travel through it. Okay. Let's see if I can get this a little bigger. My computer's jumping around a little bit. Um, something I actually really like is uh, okay, so Tia just said the first image has masking fluid on it and then I put the white gouache on after. Yeah, okay. Um, so gouache and watercolor are both water-based paints. The difference essentially with them more or less is that watercolors have a transparency to them. So we see this lovely transparency all in here, right? You've got layers of color, but you can see the colors kind of layered and working together, especially kind of right in here. Um, that transparency is part of the strength of using a watercolor is that you can see these richness of pigment and colors and layer them and still see the other colors through each other. Gouache is an opaque pigment. And what this means is it doesn't have the transparency that watercolor has. It's thicker. And so it kind of blocks out areas of color for yourself. Um, and so they do work really well together, especially if you want to add in highlights or emphasize lights and darks. Something I like about this image is I'm immediately thinking flowers, but then as I spend time with it, and especially because of this, I'm like, oh no, 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 jellyfish. And I love that it plays with that. And then you see the background and environment and you can see seaweed and movement like water, but you could also see kind of motion, like maybe flowers in the wind from different angles. So I love 
that it's playing with that. And that um, while I do believe they are jellyfish, that it has that flowery like nature feel as well. So it kind of plays with landscapes. Um, I really do think this is my favorite part of the piece. Um, there's something so lovely and delicate about this and how the white was used. It looks really good. I am curious about our value tone, like the value scale and how many lights and darks we have in here. So let's look at it in black and white. Um, I do think it has a lot of middle grays. And so if she wants to amp up the kind of movement of the work. Um, if you notice kind of down in here, we have some darker kind of black tones in our colors. And I think that would really add even more depth. Karen says, I love the suggestion of depth. Yeah, there is this layering because of that transparency of color and, and the layers and the way that she has kind of that seaweedish line moving, there is depth. Um, I think there would be even greater depth if we had some of these more darker darks kind of emphasized in different areas. And it could be even in the background, right? Like I love kind of down in here um, and how that helps this kind of move back. Um, so that's something Something that Chia could be thinking about. When something's underwater, light sources are different and you can play with them. So she'd have to think about how she wanted that to kind of work on her image. And of course, you don't want to do it on top of the final artwork unless you really know what you're doing with it. So you might have a printout of your image to paint on or try with colored pencil even on top of it just to kind of see if you have um, kind of more layers that way added and, and a sense of, of three dimensional depth or kind of a sense of distance. Um, I think that could be really interesting. I really like her limited palette in this, so I'm not sure I'd ask her to have more colors. I just do think that this darker blue is really nice and it might be nice. And whatever we did in here for these darker kind of turquoise areas, again, have those darker values. I, I want to see more of that. Um, again, it's always this balance of how much is too much. Uh, so that's, that's just the game we play. Um, and that's part of what we have to figure out. Um, this is really nice too. So yeah, I think, uh, I think that's really nice. I think because you have all of these patterns up here um, and movement, the eyes can still move through this piece and, and have some interest. Though if we do look at it in terms of negative space, this is kind of a very even shape where you have some really lovely negative space that moves around down here. So, you know, there's a couple of ways we could handle that. Um, I mean, I don't know that I want more kind of jellyfish, um, but you could have some kind of peeking off in different spots, um, just a hint of them like there and there. Um, you need an odd number. I mean, you don't have to, but that's kind of a rule of composition is odd numbers seem to be more visually appealing. So that's, that's a rule that I, I tend to stick with. So Tia, I hope this gives you some ideas. Um, I, yeah, I, I really don't know that I want you to touch anything about this or this. Um, I kind of love this whole bottom. This whole bottom bit is just like my favorite section. There's a nice sense of variety in tone and the way that the colors have been used and the sense of movement with your white added. I think all of that's quite nice. Um, yeah. So thank you again, Tia, for sharing your work with us. Um, I do look forward to hearing what you think and kind of where you decide to go from here. Okay, so Tia, we're gonna close out here. Oops. Next, we have um, someone who I know as Bleep Eater um, on Twitter. And so this is a photograph that they shared with us and asked for feedback or a read. So I have it so that the image is also in my Photoshop here. So let me let me open that up. Um, so the first thing I, I wanna say about this image is, I think it has a pretty good use of the rule of thirds. If you don't know about the rule of thirds, it's the idea, you know how when you use Instagram, you can have like a hashtag set up on your camera. That's, that's the rule of thirds. And anywhere where you intersect with these two lines um, or any part of the hashtag, these are good areas to have a focal point. Okay, it's, a, it's just a, it's one rule of composition you can use to help you have a strong composition. And when we look at this, um, I think it's quite clear that we have kind of an area all along this kind of bottom right corner that's using rule of thirds and drawing our attention because the light is brightest there. Um, 
I start there and then I kind of move this way. And that's because there is this, this feeling of direction. And then what's nice is there's another kind of bubble or ball, right? I think these might be kind of lamp reflections. Um, I like this kind of play of reality and you're not sure what is what. And then you have some movement and things that bring you back this way. So looking at how our eyes travel through an artwork is very helpful because it helps you see, am I using all of the space? Do the people who observe this artwork see and move through the whole space? Because that's part of what we're looking at is composition, right? Matia says, yes, thank you. Great, I'm glad it could help. Um, I really like these kind of strong whites because they do bring me straight there and they make me think of lamps. So it feels like a wall and lamps and maybe reflections on a metallic surface and then not. Um, lots of lots of layering here. Um, I do believe this is a digital kind of digital painting, so to speak. Um, and I feel a sense of story because I can associate it with all these things. So even though it's essentially a non-objective work, which means you don't really have anything that looks like re reality in here. Um, so, you know, I'm imagining these are kind of light reflections, but they could just be white balls and orbs of light. Um, so uh, non-objective art is a kind of abstraction where you don't really have any reference to reality, um, but you can bring in your own ideas where abstraction you know, some might argue this is more abstraction than non-objective because I'm seeing lamps in it. But again, that's not entirely clear. Um, I do think this could be a lamp, but um, I do like the playing and layers. I like the limited palette. So this is a monochrome image, which again means you're using one color and you're using all of its tints and shades, which means tints are when you add white to a color and shades are when you add black. And this is essentially a black and white image. It kind of has a cream in it. Um, but so let's just look at it in black and white too to see. So you can see you've got really nice steps and gradations from light to dark as well in this image. And I think that's another really good use of, um, well, that's just a good compositional decision to make is to have all those gradations and steps. Um, if we notice too, when I do make it kind of truly black and white, you notice there's kind of, it's almost divided in thirds a little bit. So two thirds is this darker area and one thirds lighter, but because you have super bright lights on this side, there is a really good feeling of balance as well, but it doesn't feel even either. It's not divided in half. And we also have an angled shot. And when you have angled lines in an image that creates a feeling of movement movement or action. And all of the lines here are on angles. So that also helps create a feeling of movement. Uh, so thank you, Bleep Eater, for sharing your work. You didn't really tell me what you wanted in terms of a reading. So I'm just going to, you know, share as I did today. Um, and that's what I'll do for any of you who ask. Sometimes you just want a reading of your artwork to have a new perspective or a new way that someone might look at the work and help you decide how to work on future works. Or maybe you weren't consciously thinking about how you divided the kind of lights and darks in the space. And now you know that's something you want to do in future works. That's one reason feedback like this is so valuable. I've got two more people that I'm going to try to squeeze in today. Um, I also would like to wish all my Americans happy Thanksgiving. Okay, Patty. Um, she is struggling for likeness on this face. She said that she's been doing, she knows that the weight, the face feels too wide, but when she does measurements, it seems like it appears correct. So she's trying to figure out what that's about. And I think she's right. And I think it has everything to do with shading. So let's take a look at her image here and see what happens. So if we look at the man's face, kind of in, well, let me draw on it first. If we look on the man's face, there's almost like there's a clear shape right here that's darker. And she did try to create that. Um, and I do think that that's kind of showing. But what also has happened is this area of his face is much lighter than the skin tone that she has on her image. And I think that's part of why it's not feeling like it's right yet, so to speak. So let's take that tone. And let's see what happens if we start to paint in with it over here. So 
something that we don't understand is sometimes when we are doing these measurements, um, we know the measurements are right and it doesn't look right. And it's because we don't have the right tones or, or values in an image. And so that doesn't allow the shape or form to really come forward. Um, so I'm kind of filling it in and looking at these spaces just to see you know, what I, I notice. And obviously I'm not blending it in. I'm just kind of filling it in to see if we, we feel that there's a difference to the face. So I'm just gonna kind of quickly sketch that in. Um, something I do notice by doing this is um, more of his hair is showing kind of over here. And look at this bearded area. There's totally white beard showing. And what's the angle? this angle should match exactly on this. And so I think that's a little bit of the tweaking that needs to happen. And when I do this, the other thing I wonder about is the ear. There's something about the ear. So look at, whoops, the ear kind of finishes not at the bottom of the nose, but kind of right here. And I do, yeah, I don't know, that looks pretty accurate to me. Hmm, yep. Maybe it just feels like it's sticking out too much. There's like a, that's what it is. There's a curve here that um, Patty has in her image that we don't see in the photograph. Um, it's kind of, it's just totally straight right here. And then you have kind of his earlobe right at the bottom. And I think that earlobe maybe has started a little too high. I think maybe it should be down here and it, this should just be straight up. So that could be the issue. Um, yeah. That's some food for thought. Um, a lot of these measurements do look accurate to me. I do think it's about tone tonality and making sure our lights and darks are matching. Um, this part of the neck looks like it's a little too big. It might need to come in a little bit here. Um, and again, this angle seems a little more um, straight to me. So you notice I kind of, there's a curve here that we see in her painting. And I don't think that that curve is nearly as obvious in this man's face. It's more narrow and it's kind of this very soft edge. Um, so I think that that would also fix this up a bit. Yeah, there we go. Do you see how wiping that out really helped that side of the face? I see a big shift there. Um, so then that also means there's kind of shapes around here that are darker. Um, kind of around the top of his head and side. Let's make sure that those tones are also matching. So I do, I think this is a bit of a color game and, and really looking at highlights and lowlights and seeing what we find. Um, one way to help ourselves do that again is to look at an image in black and white. Um, so you can see here when we do this, that when we look at her image, it's kind of all the same gray for the whole head and the whole kind of side of the face on both sides. And so that doesn't give us the dimension or suggestion of form that would help us see that kind of roundedness on the face. So really look, Patty, and see kind of where the edges of those lights go. And you could dry brush that in if you didn't want to, you know, um, have to use fresh paint all over. It depends. I think you said you were working with oils, though. So um, the only area that I actually think is inaccurate, really, is this corner area here, and maybe something to do with the bottom of this ear. Um, again, you've got kind of a jaw edge on this corner, too, and and he's got just a straight line here. So um, go back and just look at those angles just a little bit. Those are small tweaks and really focus on tones. I think you're super close here. I think it's just a matter of giving yourself space to really see it and, you know, perhaps flip the image upside down while you're painting some of the skin tones, if that will help you kind of get out of your head and stop observing the person. Because I do see that you've got a lot here that looks really spot on. Um, that ear might just finish there. Um, yeah, so thank you, Patty. I love that you're always so willing to um, offer your work for feedback. Um, and I think this is looking really nice. I do see the likeness for sure. Um, so keep at it and uh, let us know how it goes. Okay. Oh, Karen, you're welcome. Okay, one more work. We're gonna see if I can squeeze Veronica in real quick. You know what? No, Veronica, I'm gonna save you for next week because I don't like when I feel rushed. I like to make sure I give you guys the, the time you deserve. So Veronica, we'll start with you next Feedback Friday and anyone else who would like to join me. Um, let me switch my screen here.
Um, if you would like to be in a future Feedback Friday, you can email me carrie at artiststrong.com and send me images of your art or links to your work. Um, the other thing you can do is post it in messaging me on the Facebook page, which is backslash becoming artist strong, or you can do it in the Facebook group, which is becoming artist strong. So I look forward to seeing and sharing your work. I do ask you to think about this. When you watch these videos, even if your work wasn't in it today, how can you take this information and apply it to your own art? That's part of the value of having a feedback environment and a critique space where you all can get information from each other. It's so very powerful. And that's also part of why I created my program called The Circle, which is currently open for enrollment. The Circle starts January 4th, 2019, and it's a six month mastermind for artists. And there's two different levels. So there are artists who are looking to find their voice. They don't quite have it yet and they're not sure what it should look like or how to articulate even what their, their style is. Um, and they don't know strategies to help them develop it either. So that's, that's kind of a path that several artists go down. And then we also have artists in the group who are working towards a series of artworks. They kind of know their style and they're looking to build community and connection. And all of these people work side by side, get this kind of feedback and support and accountability to make sure that they show up for their art. If you are interested in that kind of support and accountability, then visit artiststrong.com backslash the hyphen circle. I'll make sure the link is in my replay access kind of comment area as well for you too. Um, I love this program. I love the humans that choose to show up and, and become part of the circle. It's a wonderfully kind spirited, like compassionate and motivating space that helps artists get results. So be sure to sign up if you're interested while enrollment is still open. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. And I really do look forward to seeing you in a future Feedback Friday. Uh, Karen, I'm so glad you learned a lot. Thanks for being here. Um, thank you to everyone, Tia and Kirsten, all of you who have joined me live. And for those of you watching the replay, be sure to say hi too. Thanks again and have a wonderful weekend.